All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Hope you're all doing well. I know it turned a little bit colder outside today, unlike the beautiful spring weather we had over the weekend. Um, but I hope you're all staying warm and safe at home. Um, I'm happy to be able to present here today um, this webinar featuring Amelia Siders um, from Children's Advocacy Centers of Michigan. Hi, Amelia. Hello. Good, good afternoon. Yeah, um, they're kindly uh, giving us some time to share out um, some information on childhood trauma, especially during this time of crisis. Um, and we're going to have some time for you to ask questions and, and chat further with Amelia after um, the presentation. And I am recording it today um, in order to preserve it for those that aren't able to attend live with us. And uh, the links are on your screen. I'm also pasting them in the chat box for the handouts today, as well as a quick survey at the end. Um, so without further ado, Amelia, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here okay. and let you get started. So welcome. Well, thank you very much, Kathy. It's so great um, to see you again. Kathy and I worked together um, several years ago when she was in Traverse City, Michigan at the um, Travis Area District Library. And so we got to connect at a CAC level when I was the program director at the Children's Advocacy Center um, in Traverse City. So we did a, um, we connected on a body safety presentation. I think it was, I'm sure Kathy at some point yeah. might be happy to share that experience with everybody, but it was a wonderful experience to um, kind of in a great example of how children's advocacy centers and libraries can partner together. Yeah, it was wonderful. It was My Body Belongs to Me um, about child sexual abuse uh, story time and musical presentation that we did up there with Jennifer Strauss and Miriam Pico. So thank you for sharing that. It was wonderful. It was great. It was great. So um, so anyway, I'm Amelia Siders. I am the Director of Clinical Practice Development Education for Children's Advocacy Centers of Michigan. I'm going to kind of go through just a quick we're going to jam a bunch of stuff in this period of time. So um, my email is at the end of the slides. I think Kathy shared it with you at the beginning. If there's anything that you're looking for more information on or you want to have a further discussion about that, please don't hesitate to email me um, for follow-up because I'm going to be going over some things, <laughs> kind of highlight, highlight reel of child trauma. How fun. Um, and, but that if there's anything more in depth that you're looking for, um, let me know. So we will get started here. Um, I wanted to first talk about what children advocacy centers are quickly, because some of you may be familiar with them. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about CACs of Michigan, which is the chapter organization that I now work for. Um, I did work for almost nine years at the Traverse Bay Children's Advocacy Center as the program director and clinical director there. And then um, last October, transitioned over to the state level. So let's see if this works. Okay, I think it does. All right, I am going to see if we can, we tried it before. I'm gonna play this for you guys. A Children's Advocacy Center, or CAC, provides support to victims of child abuse. Without a CAC, an abused child may have to tell their story over and over again in settings that may be scary or where kids may think that they're in trouble. Then, families have to search around for the services their children need, all on their own. But in a CAC, a child tells their story to a trained interviewer who makes the process gentle on the child and finds the facts which are crucial to the child's case. Then, a community of professionals in medicine, law enforcement and child protective services, prosecution, victim advocacy, and other heroes work through the CAC to decide the best way to help the child. And CACs provide science-backed mental health care that heals kids from trauma and helps them reclaim their futures. This community of caring professionals rallies around the child so children have everything they need, all in one place at the CAC. To find your local CAC or to sign up for updates, visit nationalchildrensalliance.org. All right, so that just gives you a quick and dirty overview of CACs. 
Um, I wanted to share that just so you get a sense of things. One of the, the great um, pieces of a CAC is a multi multidisciplinary team model. So we really pride ourselves on that, um, working with law enforcement, um, prosecuting attorney's office, um, victim advocates, um, child protective services, and work for the best um, interest of the child. It, it is totally child focused. So um, that's, that's a really important piece for us. Um, Children's Abbey Centers of Michigan. So we're a chapter organization. We do not provide the services. What we do is we support all of the services that happen in Children's Abbey Centers throughout Michigan. Um, there's about 32 with several um, developing CACs in addition to those 32 CACs in Michigan. If you go on to cac.org, cacmi.org, cacmi.org, that will give you the you can also look on that website, our website, for all of our information, and it'll show you the CACs throughout the state. I, if you haven't already, I strongly urge you to connect with your children's Abbey Center um, in the county that, you, that you're in. They're in most counties and cover most counties. There are only a few um, that we don't um, cover right now. We even have them up in the UP right now. It's really exciting. There's some developing ones up there. So um, our job is to really support training and best practice. Um, push through public policy and um, make sure that all of these things are child-centered and how we're looking at things. We're currently really re, you know, looking at the trial process for children and ways that we can help with bench cards for judges and attorneys and you know, shifting policy on forensic interviews being allowed and admissible in the courtroom right now in Michigan. They are not. So children come to a CAC to get interviewed and it's, it's taped, but that tape can only be shown to the judge and jury if the defense attorney has an issue with it and brings it in as evidence. So we would like to change that. It would be great if children don't have to recount that abuse in court um, in the same way. And public awareness, outcome measurement, data measurement and research and fundraising, supporting fundraising efforts of all the CACs. Those are, um, kind of the main goals and we get support and, and my position is funded through the Michigan Division of Victims um, Services, Midwest um, Regional Children Advocacy Center and the National Children's Alliance as, as most of our physicians are at CACMI. So we're gonna start out and I wanted to just talk to you guys in general, understanding the gigantic issue that is abuse of children. Um, some of you, I may be preaching to the choir. Um, this is some newer data we have from the Michigan League for Public Policy um, that looks at 2010 to 2018. And our, you know, abuse and neglect has increased um, in 81 of 83 counties throughout the state of Michigan by 71.8% statewide. So that is gigantic. And that's not necessarily because there's more abuse happening. It's also because people are uh, just reporting the abuse where before it had stayed hidden and um, children were, I think people are stepping up to protect kids a lot more than they used to with us edu the education of things. And I do think that there's been a difference in the last 10 years, we've really seen an explosion of children's advocacy centers. So that has helped as well. And so I just wanted to share some information and stats kind of before we even had COVID-19. And so this is an interesting study that RAIN um, reported in terms of their numbers just since the beginning. Um, we'll, we'll go into that in a minute, but that in general, 34% of child sexual abusers are family members. So when we think about what's going on with COVID-19 and schools are closed, youth activities are closed, children are much more isolated. And, and we'll talk about that a lot more, but but that they are home with these people that are abusing them many times. So we have a large percentage of children that are abused by people in the home they live in. And then about 90 to 95% statistics are telling us nationally of um, children are abused by people they know. So it may not be someone in the home, but it's someone they know. So this kind of this whole idea that there's a myth of the stranger danger. We don't have to be worried about strangers as much as we have to be worried about the people in a child's life that are offering to do things going above and beyond. And sometimes they're doing those things to get access to kids. And it doesn't mean we have to be suspicious of everyone, but we do need to be aware that the people bringing the kids into the library every day 
could be people that are abusing them, unfortunately. So during, you know, just in the last few months, we've been able to get some, some information. Rain has shared that a 22% increase in monthly calls. And what's really interesting is that half of these contacts were from children themselves making contacts, which is really, usually we do not get children calling in to hotlines as much as we do adults. And 67% who contacted the hotline and match identified the perpetrator as a family member and 79% said they were living with that person. So that is just, that's horrifying. Um, I think many of us that, that work in the child abuse and neglect field, you know, that's the kind of stuff that keeps you up at night when you think about it. Um, some of the initial research that we're getting, so we have an increase obviously in kids being locked down with these people. They don't have the ability to get help and support. And then we also have an increase in mental health issues. So there's some, some initial studies um, and research coming out of Wuhan, China and um, a city about 85 miles from Wuhan, where we're seeing increases in depressive symptoms um, that were normally not as high in some of these areas in previous studies, as well as anxiety symptoms. And in the United Kingdom, um, 2,000, a little over 2,000 participants, up to 25. So they were also looking at college students as well. Um, that 83% of these people with a pre-existing issue of depression, anxiety, something like that, said that it's made their condition worse. So we're also looking at children who have been traumatized previously and young adults who've been traumatized previously and how um, being sheltering in place, being isolated from the things that they, they were able to um, access before and that so many children and adolescents and young adults got services through their schools for mental health, and that has stopped. Um, we are getting more telehealth services available, but if you don't have access to the internet, that isn't as easily accessible for you. So I'm going to start and, and talk a little bit about what trauma looks like in the brain and what it looks like for um, children that you know, have had, have gone through something pretty stressful and how it impacts learning. So I wanted to go over that in the beginning here with everybody. And I guess, Kathy, if there's anybody that has a specific question you think is relevant as it comes up, please don't. I can't, in order for me to kind of look at everything, it's hard for me to look at the chat box too. So if you see something, I'll try to look at it periodically that comes up. Don't hesitate to interrupt and let Definitely. me know. So if you have a question, please let Kathy know and don't hesitate to interrupt me. I don't need to keep talking and talking. I'm happy to stop for a second. Um, so what's really important to understand when we think about learning and processing, and it's not just school learning, it's learning any type of activity that a child um, needs to process and understand, is that when you have children that have a higher level of stress and have a history of trauma, okay, um, they are activated by things in the environment a lot more than children that have not had those experiences. So when we think about that, that means that anything, and we don't always know what they are, things could trigger a child, and when they are triggered and they're not really understanding and processing at the same level because they're activated and upset, they can't participate in their own safety, they can't problem solve in the same way that we would expect. Um, because they're feeling threatened. So thinking and reasoning is impaired. And so if you have kids that are living in an environment that has domestic violence, that, that has sexual abuse going on, these kids are actively, activated most of the time. So even problem solving normal things and thinking through how they could deal with something that's going on in their lives in that time, and God forbid going to school and trying to sit for several hours and understand what's going on, that is all compromised for these children. So I like to use this, um, and you guys should have all of this in the handouts, I, I, I put them all there, but the upstairs downstairs brain and understanding the difference between, this is a great thing to share with parents, it's a great resource to have. I, I like it because it's quick, it's easy to understand for me, um, who's not gonna remember every little piece of, of brain functioning, but um, I am going to show you my fun little, um, I got to make sure it's in here. So 
so this is a good example of what happens when children are activated. So if we're looking at, so if we look at my thumb here and, and this whole area here, this is gonna be what we would think is the downstairs brain. It's a brain stem, the limbic system, kind of basic bodily functions and emotional reactivity, okay? So that's this part of the brain, the upstairs brain, is what my fingers are covering that area, okay? And making it a fist, I'm trying to do this. So, okay, there's that better. Everything's backwards, the video. And um, so this is where the upstairs brain, so we have this, the decision-making, the planning, kind of understanding of why you're getting upset and being able to regulate yourself and kind of thinking about that. The thought process, control over emotions, all of that is, is housed. So we want these things working together. And so when you have a regulated child, you have a child that's, that's doing okay and is responding to stress well and doesn't have necessarily a lot of stressors or trauma in their history, all these things work together. But when we get activated, this is what we call flipping the lid. So when your lid is flipped, and this is why I like this um, visual, everything's disconnected. So you're reacting and you're having all of these responses and you, your brain and your thought process and your ability to think through and decision-making, that's up here, it's not connected. You are out of that piece for yourself. And so you may be acting strangely, you may be, you know, children may be running, they may be hiding somewhere, they may be aggressive, there's all different responses. So the goal is to help kids get regulated and that's where counseling and working with families comes in to help um, parents learn how to help their kids regulate, how we can learn how to help kids regulate is to get this working together. Because if you're trying to deal with a child who split their lid, and I bet many of you have seen evidence of this at work or at home many times, you can't reason with them. You can't explain why they need to stop doing something. Sometimes you just have to respond by, sometimes it may be holding a child so they don't run out into the street, okay? You, you're not gonna be able to explain why they shouldn't do that. You're just gonna have to go get them, right? So this is the goal. We want these, this whole brain working together to respond to stress. And along that same vein, we're figuring out how children learn and how trauma impacts learning and understanding. And just even the times that they're in the libraries trying to read, trying to engage in programming. Um, Cognition is at the top of this pyramid. And so thought process, understanding, integrating information, learning information, that comes last. So we have children who've experienced trauma who are currently in danger and are coming into the libraries. Survival, okay, is the biggest piece that has to be provided. So it's a bottom-up approach when we're looking at trauma and that we have to provide safety and security and connection for kids before they're gonna be able to learn anything or keep it there. And so first it's providing safety. And sometimes libraries, I know that for many children, libraries are a place of safety and security, that they feel like it's a place they can go where they can have some quiet, where they feel they can get a break from some of the things that are going on. Um, so that may help their physical and emotional regulation, which is that next piece from the bottom up approach of, of being able to just regulate. And then they can connect. So, and so once you're feeling safe, once you can regulate yourself, then you can connect with other people. Um, and then the thought process and the understanding and, and the cognition piece kicks in at that point. So we look at just the broad spectrum of how kids learn and engage. Traumatized kids, we have to go through all these steps for them before they get to the point where they're gonna learn and really get what we're, what we're trying to teach them. So, I talk here about challenging children, and this slide I use a lot when I work with teachers, when we have kids that are acting out and getting extremely agitated and aggressive at school. And so I, I use the term challenged or challenging kids. Um, and it's really children that have behavioral responses to stress most of the time. And some of the key concepts that, that we need to remember is that children who do not have the ability to really cognitively get in process and the lid is flipped, okay? They can't tell the difference between a real threat and a perceived threat. So for them, if an adult walks towards them and puts their hand on their shoulder or even kind of points their finger at them, okay? For a child that might be experiencing domestic violence at home, that to them could perceive, oh, they're gonna hit me. Oh, they're gonna do this. And so even though you may be perfectly safe, 
supportive adult, if they perceive that as a threat, they're going to respond. They, they have a diff, you know, very different um, understanding and, and ability to differentiate between that real and perceived threat. They also are gonna struggle with the difference between being physically safe and feeling safe. So, and what this means is that children don't, you know, even though you may think you're providing a safe place, that, you know, the children's section, the adolescent, the youth section of the library it may be a wonderful, warm, inviting place for kids to be. But if there's anything in that environment that is triggering for them, or anything that's happening in that environment, some kids yelling, they overhear something, if they don't feel safe, no matter what the environment is, how safe it is, how we think it's safe for them, they're still going to respond. Then also being scared and being in danger to them can feel like the same thing. They have a different difficulty differentiating between just a heightened level of stress and being in active danger. So for kids that are feeling frightened or anxious, for them that may, that may be a gigantic threat and they feel that they're in danger. So that fight flight response, the reactivity and this breach of integrity they feel, those are all real things that they're experiencing, though how they are perceiving them is off because they have become attuned to be so hypervigilant that they're, that they're really unable to tell the difference between a real and perceived threat. Are there any questions or anything? As there, we... there haven't been any questions yet. I did ask any experiences. Um, I'm definitely remembering like sometimes when like going to approach a child or a young teen that might be acting out and then they just take off <laughs> and, and, and run. And rather than chase them, we have to decide, you know, is this worth that? Yep. Um, and then there's some praise. So Sarah says in the chat, um, she's a CASA C -A -S -A worker and youth awesome. services yeah. librarian and has um, often confronted misinterpretation of challenging behaviors among library staff. Um, so, and we're the Library of Michigan. We're not MLA, Sarah, just a heads up. <laughs> But now, we all one, get our acronyms confused. <laughs> one thing I will say that's really a critical piece that we don't have a lot of time to go into today is the, the best way to interact with kids with challenging behavior is to understand what your challenging behavior is first and what your stuff is because our stuff is going to react and interact with their stuff. So, so really being aware of what your triggers are, what your stress level is, all of those things and that I think if it's possible and you have a few people that you work with in the library, if you've had a long day with activated challenging kids, you may not, you may need to tag, you know, tap out and ask someone else to help when another situation arises, if you kind of have hit your limit. So being aware of where you are and what triggers you with certain children or certain situations is going to help you handle those things better. Um, Amelia, I think that's yeah. a fantastic point. Um, a lot of our libraries are very small or might not have many staff members to tag in and out, um, but just being able to be aware of your own reactions. Well, then my response to that would be, if you are able to get help then, then it's a great opportunity to model stress reduction. And you say, you know what? I'm getting really frustrated right now. So I am gonna take five deep breaths to calm myself down because it's getting so loud in here and I'm, I'm really struggling with staying calm because I'm, I'm just feeling, I bet other people are feeling stressed out. And so then you, you model and you do it right in front of them, <laughs> calming yourself down um, because it's just a great opportunity for them to see an adult handling stress appropriately and responding appropriately. It's not gonna solve all the problems, but um, five deep breaths can help <laughs> a lot sometimes, <laughs> a lot more than you think. Um, I have a lot of people ask me, well, what, what does what abuse kids look like? What does trauma look like? How do we know if a child's being traumatized? Um, there's, no, there's no one way to be able to tell you this. It's not, and no one thing. You know, I testify in court, I'm an expert witness sometimes about sexual abuse and severe physical abuse. And the thing is, there's so many common elements to different mental health issues as well as abuse. But the biggest issue in terms of abuse is a change, a change in behavior. So for kids that you've known for a while and they come back after this time, 
if there's if there's really a shift in how they're presenting that doesn't mean they've been abused but it is something to pay attention to and and wonder about and check in with the child um, how are you doing so a real shift in hygiene and appearance though i think all of us <laughs> There's probably been a big shift in hygiene and appearance during this when we're stuck at home for long periods of time. So I kind of give that a little bit of a, a break initially, but really significant changes. Children that you noticed aren't bathing, aren't, aren't being, you know, taking showers. Um, you know, it looks like they, they've lost a lot of weight. Um, one of the big things when they're missing school and they hadn't before. So really it's change, it's change. And in, you know, a use of drugs and alcohol that seems very sudden and um, and then dissociation is one of the big signs of trauma in a, in a way to cope with trauma. So kids that are spacing out, that are daydreaming a lot more, that are just not focusing and attending when they used to, that's that could be another sign. One of the things that I really wanted to point out here at the end of this slide, and I put a different color, was self-harm behaviors. So self-harm behaviors are things like cutting cutting on themselves, um, pinching themselves, plucking hair, plucking eyebrows, pluck, you know, there's all different picking. So kids that are picking at scabs and they never let them stop, you know, that can, can be considered if it's an excessive thing, a self-harm behavior. And we need to, you know, it's again, you guys are not, you, you know, I'm not telling you you need to diagnose or um, be able to, to, to assess those things necessarily. But if you see, see a young person with a bunch of scratches up and down their arms, it could be an opportunity for you just to check in with them and say, gee, you know, I noticed you're wearing a short sleeve and you've got these marks. I hope you're doing okay. Is there anything, you know, are there any resources we could connect you with? And that just may be connecting with resources that, that you might be able to provide or even just showing concern can make a big difference to that young person. Um, it's, you know, self-harm behaviors are really tricky. And for the most part, I can tell you research is showing us that these are adaptive responses to dealing with stress. They are less likely to be necessarily suicidal indications, but more likely kids that are doing this on a serious continual basis. And the adolescents that I've worked with over a long period of time are doing it to cope. It's a, it's a coping mechanism. It is not a suicidal, it's not a kind of a cry for help in the suicide way. It's a way they deal with stress. It's not, it's a very maladaptive way to deal with stress, but it is a sign when you see more cuts on somebody that they're dealing and having more stress. Amelia, um, there's a question in the chat about um, when would you recommend calling um, like DHS or reporting. And I believe you're going to get to that in a minute, correct? Well, I wasn't going to spend too much time. I know that librarians are not mandated reporters, but I would strongly encourage you um, to think about yourself as a mandated reporter if you can. And that the role of somebody calling CPS and reporting a concern and when you would do that is when you have a suspicion. It is not, you don't investigate it, you don't determine if it happened or not. That's not our role, that's the investigator's role. But if you suspect something, that is enough to call. So if you suspect severe neglect, um, so you think kids are not eating or they're telling you they don't have running water or they're not eating, that could be, that could be a reason you might call. Um, if you, you know, obviously bruises that you're seeing, things like that in a child, or if any child discloses to you something that really makes you suspicious or concerned about sexual abuse or physical abuse, um, it's, it's always, you know, if you can make that call and it's not easy to do, I understand that, um, they will keep you anonymous, though I, I get the reality that if a child goes to the library and someone, <laughs> and they, then they get a visit the next, you know, next day from something they can put two and two together, the parent or the caregiver, it could make a life and death difference for that child. Um, and it, they're not going to be pulled from their home for probably 90% of what's going on. Most of the time parents will get education and support and um, CPS will be involved in their lives. I can tell you it feels like CPS is just pulling kids left and right, but um, the nine years that I worked at the CAC, that was less likely to happen. It was more likely that they would kind of monitor and support the parents. Um, and parents need sometimes support and ideas about how to alternatively discipline and deal with their children. And Amelia, can, if you go back one slide, um, can you provide more examples on what to say and how to approach children or teens that you are concerned about? Um, are you talking about self-harm? Yes. 
Um, I think what I do, again, it's something that if they're, if they're pushing up the sleeves of something or they're wearing shorts and you can see fresh cuts, or even if they don't look too fresh, but they're still pretty noticeable, um, sometimes it just, it depends on how comfortable you feel with that child. If, but if there's something pretty serious and you see a lot of fresh cuts or even something bleeding, some kids may actually go into the restroom at the library and self-harm. Um, so, so that would be an opportunity where you could, you could, you know, the best way to approach it is not to be, a, you know, accusatory and what are you doing? I'm, you know, it's more to say, look, I'm wondering if everything's okay with you. I'm concerned about you. Um, you know, we, I don't know you very well, but I've seen you in here a few times. And it, it looks like those cuts on your arms or your legs or whatever are pretty fresh. And, and I just want to make sure you know that, that this is a safe place. And if there's anything I can do to connect you with some resources, please let me know. Um, that's, that's probably how I would approach it is more as a concern. Um, if you feel comfortable enough to point it out, even if you don't want to directly say something about the cutting, it could just be going and, and kind of sitting down next to that young person and checking in with them and just saying, hey, we haven't seen each other in a while. I've seen you come in here a few times. Um, how are you doing? Is there anything you're interested, you know, just even starting up a conversation where you're making a connection with that young person might lead to them being able to talk to you a little more or open up to you a little more. Great, thank you. Okay, so when we're looking at how we can improve learning for children um, in any type of environment, the biggest piece is our learning, <laughs> is changing our understanding of how we label behaviors of kids. Because if we change that understanding, if we, if we look at a challenging or difficult you know, child and shift that to be, um, this, is, this is actually behavior that was adaptive. You know, if you take a child who ran away every time somebody got violent, that's a pretty good behavior, right, to develop if you're in an unsafe environment. Now, they're in the library, they're probably not in danger of being hurt, but if they are triggered, they have that same response. So we call it, it's over-adaptive behaviors at this point, but it's, it's also just kind of saying, all right, we can improve learning by, by asking ourselves, I wonder what happened to that child to make them behave that way, instead of saying, I wonder what's wrong. What's wrong with that kid? Now, again, in my mind sometimes that first response and we get really frustrated with the challenging child is oh god what's wrong with that you know why are they doing this but then you kind of back up you take a breath and you're like all right i'm wondering why this is happening um so if we can change our reactions and we can stay the biggest thing to improve learning if you've got a child who's dysregulated is for you to be regulated if you're regulated if your breathing is normal if you aren't standing and stressed, if you kind of pay attention just to even how tense you're keeping your body, if you sit next to a child instead of standing over them, um, and those types of things can change that response in that child, it can change their reactivity and help them regulate. There's even things you know to do, there's quick little ideas, and I don't know how um, able you are to do this in the library, but I know with some kids, if you've got three or four kids that are kind of hyper and running around and you're trying to get them to calm down, a great regulation activity to get them is to even ask kids to sit or even stand in a small circle. And I, I love koosh balls because they're light, they don't do very much damage. But if you have a child who's getting really activated, a great way to regulate them quickly is to just throw a koosh ball back and forth and talk to them while you're throwing the koosh ball. It's quiet, okay? If you can pull them out of the main area and throw the cushion and say, all right, Johnny, I'm just wondering, let's throw this ball back and forth. I'm wondering what's going on with you today. You're a lot more kind of hyper and, and active today than what's going on. And it's very difficult for a child to continue to escalate when they have to throw a ball back and forth. And you can start slowing down the pace of that. And that is a really kind of tricky, the child doesn't get that you're trying to regulate them. Um, children are more likely to talk and process when they're doing something with their body and their body's engaged. So, so that's a kind of a quick and dirty way. Any other ideas that you guys have that you've utilized that are helpful? And I'll invite people that you're welcome to unmute and, and share out loud or type in the chat box.
I will say um, for story times, um, we used to um, make those uh, bottles. Oh, I'm blanking on what they're called, but you know, filled with the goo and the glitter oh, yeah. and the beads. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, you know, hot glue the top on. And if a child was getting very upset and, and, and stressed and crying, we would be able to hand that to them to just kind of engage and calm down and Putty, anything, I know putty's yeah. not probably a good idea in the library, but anything that we can, get, get, right, you know, Kathy, I love anything that keeps their hands busy, or if, you know, story times are great examples of even stress balls that the kids can hold. Um, you know, I know that some, some libraries have gotten um, funding for bumble seats and things that allow the kids to move around on the seat, um, but still sit, and those can be really helpful. That's a great idea because we have some grants coming up uh, with for COVID-19 resources and that's a great one. Um, so Kelly says that she finds it helpful to pull kids aside and not speak to them in front of their peers. Excellent point. Very good. Emily reminded me that those are called sensory bottles. Thank you, Emily. <laughs> um, Abby says that um, you know, taking a child for a walk around the building to get them to talk, to be away from the group, keep them moving. That is, all of these examples of moving are excellent, so that's great. Tisha um, has a, a balloon to pat back and forth, um, you know, with their hands that blow mm -hmm. it up. Mm -hmm. And then Everett says, um, I've started using, started programs and story times with basic mindfulness activities. It even calms the toddlers, increases focus, and Nisa says stress balls and hacky sacks for teens. Yep, and I think just going back to that, that I think two comments before, anything that you can do to transition kids from one activity to another is excellent. So mindfulness activity, even if it's a minute, two minutes long to just help kids sit and relax and practice breathing. Um, we would do something before our staff meetings at my old job called a minute to arrive, where we just took 60 seconds to practice some deep breathing to kind of let go of some of the other thoughts and things that were in our head that we're focusing on and really focusing on being in the, in the moment. And those types of transitions of um, mindfulness activities are excellent, excellent ways. Um, so, so great, wonderful examples. Um, when we're looking at recognizing trauma. So it's just some of these things to pay attention to. If you have children that you see coming in on a frequent basis, um, is just really understanding and thinking about possible things that might be going on, examples of trauma or major stressors. It could be parents are going through a divorce. It doesn't have to be sexual abuse or severe physical abuse. Every child is different and responds differently to stress. Um, what are you noticing are triggering kids? That's an important question. Is there anything in the room that seems to trigger them or any noises, anything that's happening? And then what behaviors are you observing and trying to connect those things because that might help you respond differently at, a, at another time when that's happening. And so, and then paying attention to the thoughts, feelings, and assumptions that these behaviors bring up for you. And if we can have all those things interacting, it's basically, this is just a detailed way of saying the other slide, but um, paying attention to our stuff, how that interacts with their stuff, and what the outcomes are. So, so some of the things that we wanna pay attention to that do trigger kids are unpredictable situations, sudden changes. So if you're quickly transitioning from one thing to another, that might be hard on some kids. Um, they just don't have the capacity, they need time to shift um, if, they're, if they're observing conflicts or disagreements. Or even if you're challenging them even slightly, that could be a trigger. Certain sights, sounds, and smells for kids could trigger them. So these are all things to be thinking about when you're trying to kind of rack your brain. I don't understand what set this child off. I didn't, you know. So there are all these things that could be doing that. Um, feeling vulnerable, powerlessness. Anytime a child is feeling challenged by an adult sometimes, that could trigger them. Loss of control, rejection. You know, So anything where they're feeling like you didn't call on them, that could trigger a child. And again, you don't have to always call on that child to respond, but just understanding what might trigger them is helpful. Um, and, for, and the other thing to remember is that for some kids, praise positive attention and any attempts to try to connect with them 
that could be a trigger because they're suspicious of it or they're so unused to people being kind like that to them. And that it is horribly sad. But for some kids, this is true that those things react. They react to that. They're used to being treated badly, but when they're treated well, that can activate them. So things to do when we're feeling triggered um, and the child's being triggered, you know, make sure you're breathing, be calm and help the child be calm. So that's that co-regulation piece. Um, it's not the time to try to change behavior, demand respect, really paying attention to where you are in standing near the child. Of course, personal space, we're going to be thinking about all of that very differently now. Um, so, and noticing the tone of your voice and that they're not going to be reasoning and thinking about how they're behaving in a context other than just that immediate response right in that moment. So one of the things that I really like to do when we think about triggers and looking through the, the stress, the stressor informed lens for kids um, in any type of environment, and this is in the libraries, at your homes, at, at the child's school, is how does viewing the behavior through that lens of trauma or stress change our understanding of the behavior? And so what I like to do is I'm sharing with you a picture. This is my office at the Traverse Bay Children's Advocacy Center. As you can see, there's big windows. Um, the blinds are, are shut though, so it lets in a lot of light. Um, I had kind of a mix of toys and fun things, so it's adults and kids being in this room. And one day I had a woman come into my office and she sat down on that sofa and I was sitting in my rolling chair, which is a little outside of the picture. And we were going through the intake and she was clearly agitated and stressed. She was rocking back and forth on the seat. She had trouble focusing. She had trouble attending. Um, and we got through one intake session, but I just, I didn't get a lot of information out of her. Um, she came back for the second meeting and I still had the same behavior. She couldn't focus. She couldn't attend. She clearly was activated. And I'm thinking, I'm, you know, I feel like my office, I'm trying to provide a safe, you know, comfortable place for her to be. Um, so, so I asked her, I said, you know, I've noticed that it's really difficult for you. And I know you've been through a lot, but I'm just, when you're in this space, it seems like it's stressful for you to be in this space with me. Is there anything that I need to know um, about this room that, that might be upsetting you? And she, she said, well, I'm really glad you asked. And she looks over and I don't know if you can see next to the sofa, um, there's a table with a lamp on it. Um, and that lamp, she looked at the lamp and she said to me, that's the same lamp that my husband almost beat me to death with. Okay. And, you know, I'm going, what? I mean, and, and first of all, you know, that being safe and feeling safe and feeling scared, this to me is such a good example of there was no threat. I was never going to pick up that lamp and hurt her with it. I wasn't going to do anything with that lamp. Um, but for her, sit, even sitting next to that lamp made her terrified, scared, and able to engage and, and process in our meetings. Um, so that lamp was out of the room, and it was not back in the room. It was always out of the room when she, was, when she came in. Um, I made a note. And we can't always remove all of the triggering things. I was able to, because I'm you know, a psychologist, and I was able to change that environment pretty easily for a one-on-one -on -one interaction. But it is interesting sometimes to try to look at the rooms in new services and in different parts of the library through that kind of trauma lens. And if you have one or two kids in mind, as you're trying to look through that lens for them, of what in that environment might be triggering for them, because there could be where's where you may try to kind of get them to sit in a different space, um, facing different things. There might be ways to adjust um, their position in the environment or some things in that environment that you might be able to change that might help. Um, and you might see a change in their response and ability to kind of regulate and calm down. All right, so I wanna make sure we have enough time for some questions, but I did want um, the attachments provided. I tried to give you guys some, some more information, um, ways to connect online. So there's RAIN is a great online resource for um, children and adolescents. Also, OK to Say, that's a government, I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with OK to Say, but that's a way for youth to report concerns, even things about bullying, things about other students that they're worried about. So having information um, visible 
okay, visible for children to see about how to report if they're being abused. So having a posters in visible places, several places in the library where they, they could make a call, they see a number they could write down, they have a website that they could write down. Um, having those resources available to kids is really important. Um, and that just knowing that what I can tell you again and again and again when I work with children um, who have been abused um, over the years, and they have so many things that have kind of brought them down low, that have made them not trust people, and that resilience is built by teeny tiny connections. It does not have to be a big, long-standing relationship. And so for many of these kids, it, it could be it's a teacher, it's the custodian, it's the librarian, it's somebody who smiles at them, is kind to them a few times a week, and they, they may not even, five minutes out of the day, they may connect. But having, that can make a gigantic difference in how these children cope and heal and move forward when they're dealing with things. So all of your relationships, I just wanna thank you so much for all the work that you guys do and how important those connections are, I just wanna underscore with kids. And even if it means virtually, I know um, some places are doing groups and things online with kids and story time online with kids, even connecting virtually with children right now is a way to be able to do some things um, and keep up those connections. I wanna share with you in terms of resources for kids, um, education for kids, um, no, so this is a plug, I have to tell you. So the Traverse Bay Children's Advocacy Center used to work. Um, I have a dog <laughs> and his name is Jeeves. And um, I'm just going to show you this quickly, but Jeeves has a series. So Traverse Bay CAC, as you can see at the top, dot O-R-G. Um, they have some wonderful resources that you can check into. Many CACs have wonderful resources. I'm just most familiar with this one because I worked there. Um, but at the Traverse Bay CAC, we have a series of videos. Um, I have a companion called Doc Talk that goes with Jeeves's videos for parents or caregivers. Um, these are specifically for children. And so what are private body parts? Who can see or touch your private party parts? Who are safe adults? And what are unsafe choices? So these are all videos that Jeeves stars in. And I'll just show you a little quick. Um... Hi kids, Dr. Amelia here. I'm really excited to tell you about a new project that Jeeves, my puppy and wonderful volunteer dog here at the Traverse Bay Children's Advocacy Center has taken on in addition to his regular duties. So he's been working here with me for seven years and he's learned a lot of things, listening in and talking with kids and being there and kind of going through some of the things they've been dealing with here when they've had some problems and, and difficulties. And he feels very strongly that he's got some some words of wisdom and some lessons that he wants to share with you guys. So he's going to be doing some videos for us now. And I just wanted to introduce him and say how proud I am of him of, of going forward with this new venture in his life with all his wisdom. And um, so good luck Jeeves on your new project and um, I hope you guys enjoy it. Bye. Oh, and okay, so that's where I think the little intro with Jeeves, they must have changed it. So I'll show you this. This is just quick. I just want you to see what Jeeves, so this is Jeeves Talks. So. kids. My name is Jeeves. I'm a volunteer at the Traverse Bay Children's Advocacy Center. Do you know what my job is? I get to work with kids all day long. Today I want to talk with you about parts of your body that are just for you. So obviously I'm not going to make you guys sit through that whole thing, but um, we get no Jeeves gets no royalties or anything from these videos. So, but I do want to, I think they are um, with each of these things, they're worksheets for kids. 
and talking points for adults. So it is a nice way. I have worked with a few libraries that have showed these videos um, to kids once you know, there's parental consent involved to show the series of videos and have the parents in, in, there um, to talk about it. But Jeeves does say all the private parts, penis and vagina and anus and all those things. So it's pretty hilarious for an adult to see this, but kids seem to like it and engage well with the material. So I did wanna share that as a nice resource um, I can, I can only, I only provided the cute pictures of Jeeves. We had a wonderful person who put all this together for us. So um, there's, you know, there's a bunch of intervention and things here for you guys to see. So I think that those are the big things that I wanted to make sure, I hope that I covered um, at least <laughs> over, overview of things. If there's more specifics, I'm always happy to do follow-up. Um, well, I think... I, um, you know, it's going to be a big adjustment coming out of, as we slowly turn that dial region by region, um, you know, for some kids, home is not the safest place to be, um, and they seek shelter at the library and, and places, uh, in their community. So, um, I think it's, there are some excellent, um, points in here about, like, gauging our own reactions at this time as well. When you were talking about flipping the lid, I'm like, oh, I kind of feel like my lid is flipped right now. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I'm sure others are probably feeling kind of similar. And just imagine if that was constantly your life and that is how your brain is developing in, in a stressful setting. Um, we do have a, an unanswered question. Oh. Um, we were talking about, well, I haven't brought it up yet. So we were talking about um, a little bit, um, let's say there's a child and their caregiver in the library and there's a problem and the caregiver does not appreciate how we respond or does not agree with our, you know, the librarian's response. Um, and I've had this experience personally as well, where I feel like there might be an abusive situation going on. And so then that gets churned on us as staff too. But yes. Well, and I think there's, you know, there's many ways to deal with this. One of the first ways that I encourage is if you have kind of parental and family policies posted around that talk about mutual respect, that kind of lay out your expectations of behavior in the library so that it's the, if there's a, you, you're kind of building a culture of expectation for people when you, then you can kind of utilize that instead of it being, well, I don't like your behavior. You can say, okay, you know what, you guys, um, I'm going to have to ask you to, to lower your voice and, um, you know, remember that we, you know, we at the library and you can point to the sign, you know, we have a general policy that of mutual respect and, and that we keep ourselves regulated. We're in the library and we keep ourselves respectful. We're in the library. And um, some children are going to be triggered by your, your tone of voice. And, and so we just have to be really mindful of how other people might respond to some of this as well. Um, sometimes that, that can do it. Now, sometimes no matter what you say, a parent's going to be angry and, um, the best thing you can do is keep a safe distance. You know, the closer you get to somebody, the more they may escalate. So being able to stand a little farther away, not like, oh, I'm scared of you. But, but you know, sometimes I'll say to people when I have, when I have a dad or somebody who's really um, being activated and yelling at their child is I might say, you know, excuse me, sir, I just want you to know I'm, I'm feeling a little scared of you right now. And it's making me feel a little intimidated. And so I just, I can't imagine how some of the other people and some of the kids in the library may be feeling. So I just need to ask you to lower your voice and to try to calm yourself down right now. Um, I can't imagine what other stuff is going on with you. And this isn't about me trying to judge what's, what's happening with you, but I'm just letting you know that your behavior is a little concerning. And um, we're just, we just want to make sure that everyone feels safe around here and also feel safe around you. Cause I don't think you intend for people to feel unsafe. So so again, and then making sure if you need it to get a supervisor and someone to help you. Excellent. Does that answer the question that was in the chat earlier? Or did I go off? They're, on giving, the a, they're giving a thumbs up. Okay. okay. Um, and then Bethany's asking, are there any major differences between prolonged trauma, 
such as COVID versus a traumatic event like 9-11 in, in well, children? There's, there is a difference. I don't think we know enough about COVID-19 and what we're going to see. I think that's going to be the next few years. And I think like any traumatic event, it depends on the child and that own experience. I do think there's a difference between what we call complex trauma and single event trauma. Um, and I think COVID kind of lies in the middle. I think if children are, you know, anxiety and depression related to kind of the, the stay in place in the, in the home orders right now, that may be just a significant kind of solid stressor. And that may be different than trauma, like significant trauma, but children that are exposed to domestic violence in the home and have no break from it, that's more repeated incidents of trauma over and over again. We look at com complex trauma and that has a much more significant impact on the brain and the body and um, just how the brain develops, especially in younger children. And also can add, we, I don't know if some of you guys are familiar with adverse child experiences, ACEs, but um, adverse child experiences, the more that you have of them, the more mental health, health, and um, kind of all different kinds of issues that you're going to have. So, so that is a, a list of 10 different experiences you've had before the age of 18. And the more that you have, the more likely you have complex trauma. And the more, it's not that you can't recover and do well with those things, but it's going to take longer and it's going to take more supports in place. And it's, it's going to take that person hopefully being able to get out of that environment to be able to be safe before they can heal. So I don't know if that answered. I don't know that we know the answer to the COVID and prolonged exposure. It's not for people that are really struggling with mental health issues and trauma already. It's not helping. We know that. Um, and so I think we'll, we'll kind of see in the, in the months and years that, that we come out of this, what's going to happen. And there may be a whole other kind of types of interventions and response we may need to deal with. Thank you, Amelia. Um, we have another chat question. Everybody's being shy today. Nobody's coming off the mic, huh? <laughs> um, so any uh, ideas for a trauma COVID situation um, for autistic children or families, families with autism? Are you talking about support for them while they're in their home or while they're, what would be... I think I need a little more. I think they're typing. No, I'll unmute. Okay. You. Okay. Thank um, you. My my niece is on the autism spectrum, and she's having a really hard time dealing with this. She's not in school. Their routine is different. Um, the parents. My sister tries to get her what help they can, but it's it's a difficult situation for those families. Are there? Do you have any ideas of things they could try? Well, I think that um, one of the things when I've worked with children that are on the autism spectrum is as much as you can do, and I bet they're doing this already, but as much as you can incorporate your own schedule and have schedules posted, visual, color schedules, color blocking, so a child knows what to expect, even in a regular home routine and making kind of schedule blocks of things, they're going to do better with that than open time, even at home. Um, okay. And the other thing is, so if you, it's doing a Google search and looking up for occupational therapy items for children with autism, I think that psychologically we look at lots of stuff for helping kids with autism, but I can tell you that um, if you have the financial, if they have the financial resources and support, um, getting some sensory items that you may not normally have in the home that they would have at school, um, that can really be helpful. Um, and what I've done with, with, with kids around the spectrum is we've tried to create a sensory space in the home. Um, for some kids with autism, it might mean that it could be kind of under their bed in the dark if they feel safe and comfortable there. Um, weighted blankets can be very, very helpful. Some kids respond to, to sensory things much differently. Um, but being able to wrap up, there's some pretty cheap these things called body socks that you can find online where a child can go into, it's like a worm thing. They can go into it and it kind of compresses them and makes them feel safe. It really depends. It's going to depend on that child's needs and what triggers them, but there are some great um, occupational and sensory 
um, therapy type of resources that I think can do wonders more than kind of a response, like a auditory or verbal response, sometimes giving them some sensory things can, can be helpful. And having those things um, transitioning back, I think we were talking about that in the libraries can be great too. I don't know if that was helpful or not, Kathy. Yeah, everything helps. <laughs> Amelia, um, as we wrap up here, I'm, I'm not seeing any other questions. Okay. Um, I want to remind people that in the link to the handouts, you have some additional materials um, there and some infographics. Um, any thoughts moving forward? We're not sure, like with summer reading, um, they're really it's unlikely that there'll be any in-person events and things, but a lot of libraries are talking about offering kits um, and activities to send home at like curbside service uh, style setups. Um, any, I'm kind of putting you on the spot, but any thoughts or ideas on what libraries might be able to offer um, this summer in terms of any any support to families. Can you do online things? Is the library a lot of libraries are going to be doing online um, story times, um, virtual programming, as well as online summer reading records? Well, I think I can tell you that one of the things that I think work well with, you know, not super young kids. No, so online story times can be wonderful. So that can engage parents and kids. You can do a educational component of that for parents, plus have a story time for kids. So you can pick books. Um, there's certainly safety and, and books that, um, that can address some of those concerns for kids in a way that's fun and interactive. But I would say this much of online kind of groups that you can do and engage kids, you know, having, um, you know, who, I don't, can't remember if it was you, Kathy, we were talking about the gaming you know, so I think those are wonderful things. Anything you're doing to engage and connect with kids, even if you have just a few minutes of chat time with them, um, as, as librarians is going to help. So, so though we can't, just remembering that they don't have access to a lot of connections with people um, right now, so being able to increase those connections, even if it's virtually, is still going to be better than them not having them at all. And so book clubs, um, those types of things. And if we're thinking about kind of packs to send to kids, I know, um, you know, CACs have put together some support packets and things that have stuff like you could, if you can get um, the ingredients for the sensory jars or the sensory bottles and put them in a pack, and then you could have, so you guys could do some as long as you, I mean, I know cost is an issue, but I think there's some crafts and things you could have pick up a craft and then have a virtual crafting session to connect with families. Um, I think that might be a fun way to do some stuff and connect with kids that allows some learning, some, you know, you could pick something that's kind of fun, um, but allows for that. Um, I don't know if that's something you guys are already doing and thinking about, but. It's a great idea. I didn't think about including sensory bottles. <laughs> um, so in the, um, in the chat box, I did, put a link to our My Youth virtual flyer um, flyer document. Um, we have almost 10 pages of resources now, including child advocacy, um, Children's Advocacy Centers of Michigan resources. Um, there's a mental health section that I started building thanks to a lot of help from Amelia on that. Um, so be sure to take a look at it. There are actually eBooks on talking to children about COVID-19. Um, links to those are in that doc, so be sure to check that out. Um, and then when you are doing your virtual um, um, programming with online platforms, do keep in mind um, the safety of your, of your families and the kids on those virtual platforms as well. I did want to say one more quick thing, Kathy, that I yeah. didn't really emphasize is that so internet predators are at an all-time high right now, and we do need to remember that, that some of those predators may be utilizing libraries and things once all of this is out to actually meet the kids in person. Um, mm -hmm. so, so just being more aware of people that you don't normally see at the library that are engaging with kids that you're like, you know, what's, what's going on there, asking questions, kind of just being physically kind of around in situations like that. But, 
but children are isolating a lot more in their rooms and on the internet even more than they were before. And this, this is the shift we're seeing at children's Abbey centers as just a gigantic increase in internet um, child exploitation through the internet. Um, and we've even had, you know, cases where kids have been, and Kathy, you may be familiar with some of these cases in that area where kids were picked up and trafficked by people that they met at the library, right? Or that they told, they were told to meet there and go outside and got picked up by somebody. Um, so, so, you know, that's the, the bless and the, the curse of being a great public place where people can meet. But, but I just wanted to throw that out there. It's important. I was muted. That was that is very important, Amelia. Um, thank you so much for that reminder to to be aware. Well, we are a couple minutes past our time, but it, it was fabulous information. Thank you so much, Amelia. Um, everyone, please make sure you check out the links to the handouts and the and and respond to our survey. And if you have any other thoughts or questions or ideas, you can reach out. Um, to Amelia or myself. Um, in fact, I'll put up our, our screen again. There's Amelia's email down there. Um, so thank you all so it's much. I useful, guys. I mean, I, I, try, I know I did an overview, but if there's anything more specific, please let me know. Yes, and thank you, Children's Advocacy Centers of Michigan, and thank you, Amelia. It, I'm so happy we get to reconnect. <laughs> oh my. Thank you. My pleasure. Yeah.